This is going to be a very lengthy video tutorial for those of you who have never worked with virtual machines. And I'm going to keep it moving along and as to the point as possible. So we're going to jump right in, guns a-blazing, with installing a virtual machine right away. And then in the end of this video, I will talk about some of the practical uses of a virtual machine. I will be putting timestamps in the description for anyone who wants to skip around to the different segments of the video. But with all of that being said, this stuff is not difficult, but we do have a lot to cover. So we're going to jump right in, right now. Now before getting started, one thing that you should check is to make sure that your PC has virtualization hosting enabled. This is done by booting into your system's BIOS settings, and it's different for each machine. So unfortunately, I probably won't be able to tell you how to do it on your particular machine, but a quick internet search should show you how to enable virtualization hosting on your PC. Here I'm giving an example of how to do it on a Dell Optiplex 7010 but this step will most likely be different on your system. If you skip this step, you could run into errors like these. So in this tutorial, I will also be using terms like host PC and guest PC, or host system, or guest OS, or guest machine. These terms are all interchangeable. Just know that the host is the physical or real computer that you will be working on and the guest is the virtual software installation of an emulated machine that lives inside of your real PC and can be run simultaneously with your real PC. If you're not understanding the concept, it should all make sense by the end of this video. That is if I did my job correctly. But now we can get into downloading and installing VirtualBox on our PC. I'll be doing this on Windows, but you can run VirtualBox on a Mac and Linux as well. And installation instructions for Linux and Macs are no more than a quick internet search away. This next step isn't necessary, but I highly recommend doing it. With every new installation of VirtualBox, I also install the add-on pack from Oracle's website. This add-on pack adds a lot of extra potential for your VirtualBox install and is necessary for things like file sharing between the host and guest machines, bidirectional clipboard, and drag and drop between the two machines. Again, this step isn't necessary to get your virtual machines up and running, but it's a step that I personally never skip. To get it installed, simply download the add-on pack and in VirtualBox's interface, click on Tools, then Extensions. This blue folder with the green plus sign will allow us to import a new extension. So click on that and browse to wherever you downloaded the extension pack. Agree to the licensing terms and wait a few seconds for the confirmation dialog box. After that, we can proceed. But we'll also need an ISO for installing a guest OS. For this, in this tutorial, I'll be downloading Linux Mint. Since this tutorial is for the absolute beginner, I think Mint is one of many great choices because it pretty much comes with almost everything you could ask for right out of the box. But if you want to use a different operating system ISO, you can. Just substitute the ISO of your choice in place of the Linux Mint ISO in these instructions. But just keep in mind, the further you go off script of this tutorial, the less help I could potentially be if you have any questions. After your chosen ISO has finished downloading, we can set up our virtual machine. Over here, click on this icon that looks like a blue sunburst to create a new machine. For this machine, I'm going to assign 1024 megabytes of RAM. And keep in mind that this amount of RAM is set aside from your host machine's RAM. 1024 is a little on the slim side for Linux Mint, I would be more comfortable with 2048 if I were going to use this virtual machine a lot. That's code for, if you're going to use this virtual machine a lot, put in at least 2048 here. But for the purposes of what I'll be doing in this tutorial, 1024 will be fine. We also need to create a virtual hard drive. So I'm assigning a hard drive with 20 gigabytes of space, which will be fine for this tutorial. We could create a dynamically expanding drive, but I personally prefer not to do that, and I almost never use a dynamically expanding drive. I don't want my virtual machine to expand and overtake all of the host machine's storage space. But this part is your call. I'm sticking with 20 gigabytes for a tutorial machine. And last but not least, the virtual machine will need that Linux Mint ISO that we downloaded. Over here, click on the storage setting. And we see that our top IDE controller is empty. 
This is where we point to that Linux ISO that we downloaded. So I'm going to click on this blue disk icon and browse to the location where I downloaded Linux Mint. And then I will select that ISO and click on Choose. And now we see that our top IDE controller has an ISO assigned to it. Think of this like a CD or DVD tray for your virtual machine. And the SATA controller down here, think of that as your internal hard drive. But with all of our drives assigned, we can now click on Start and fire up our virtual machine. As you can see, it booted to our Linux Mint Live ISO. And now we need to install Linux Mint to our virtual machine that we created. This works just like if you were to install Linux Mint on a real machine. And if you're unfamiliar with installing Linux, you can check out my video, Linux for the Absolute Beginner, and I'll put a link to that in the description and in a card. But this is as simple as double-clicking on this Install Linux Mint shortcut and following the on-screen prompts. It's behaving exactly as if you were to build a real physical machine with a real 20 gig hard drive and when it comes to installing a disk, if you followed the instructions exactly up to this point, you shouldn't see any other hard drives on which to install this OS. And everything on your host OS, except for that virtual hard drive that we created, is inaccessible to this virtual machine. Also at this point, take note of this lower status bar. You can mouse over and get the status of the various components of your virtual machine, but for now, just bear in mind this right control key. The virtual machine that we are creating in this tutorial will have seamless mouse integration from the host to the guest machine, so this is not something we necessarily need to worry about for this tutorial. However, if you are working with a virtual machine that locks your mouse and keyboard inside of your guest window, the right keyboard control key will unlock and send it back to your host machine. This is a small detail, but it can be pretty important to keep in mind. After you've run through the installer, it will tell you to eject the installation media and hit enter. Under this setup with this virtual machine, you don't have to eject anything, just hit enter. Now after this virtual machine reboots, it will boot into the full installation of Linux, and congratulations, you've installed your first virtual machine. It should behave as if it were a physical installation on real hardware, for the most part. Just keep in mind that not every computer has the exact same hardware combinations, so no virtual installation is guaranteed to operate perfectly. I have found that most virtual machines I've worked with haven't given me any major problems. And if you want to call this video done here, you can. You've got a basic virtual machine to work with that should get the job done in most situations. But if you really want to get the most out of your virtual machine, I recommend continuing. I promise none of the following steps are difficult. Remember how I said to install that add-on pack earlier? Well, that's with good reason. It's part of taking your productivity with a virtual machine to a whole new level. But we do have to install a few things on the virtual machine now as well. This is one of the reasons I recommended using Linux Mint for this exercise, because it keeps this part pretty simple. And if you're a bit skittish about using the terminal yet, no worries, we can do all of this with the package manager. We need to install VirtualBox's guest editions. So head over to your launch menu and go to System and launch Synaptic Package Manager. In search, type VirtualBox and wait for the results to load. From the list, check VirtualBox dash guest DKMS, VirtualBox dash guest dash X11, and VirtualBox dash guest dash utils, then click on apply. Wait for the system to install these packages, and when it's done you can close this package manager window, and then reboot the virtual machine. The main functionality that this offers is host to guest and vice versa file sharing. On the host machine, on the C drive, I've created a folder called VBox. You can name this folder whatever you want to call it, but then in the VirtualBox interface, under Settings for the Virtual Machine, under Shared Folders, I added a transient share. The folder path is to the VBox folder on my C drive, and the folder name here can be whatever you want to call it, and I personally check Auto Mount and make it persistent. Here you can also specify a mount point, but for this tutorial, I'm just going to leave this blank. And now we've created a bidirectional share for the host and guest machines, but we need to allow access to that share from the Linux side. So on the virtual machine, go to your launch bar and in search, type users. 
click on the Users and Group Settings. Then find the group named VBOX SF. The default user that you created as your primary Linux Mint account should be listed. Make sure to put a check in that box beside the username and that will give your user account access to the VBOX share and you can now share files between the host and guest machines. By default, the VBOX share will be located at slash media slash SF underscore VBOX and you should be able to see it in the devices list in your file navigation pane. The second thing we can do with guest editions is enable a bi-directional clipboard and drag and drop between the host and guest machines. However, I would consider this experimental at best. It's mostly pretty good, but it's one of those things that works when it wants to work, how it wants to work, if at all. I always enable both of these options, but I don't get my expectations very high. Copying and pasting text from one machine to the other seems to work out pretty well, but if you want to reliably move files between the guest and host, the best way to do it is probably just stick with creating a transient share, like we did earlier. Now we're going to talk about managing your virtual machines from a utility standpoint. First off, you can go through the entire virtual machine creation process and create multiple independent virtual machines. As you can see here, I have my Linux Mint installation that we just created, but I've also made a second entry and installed Zorin OS. We can also launch both virtual machines simultaneously. Just keep in mind that this can become very taxing on your host machine. Another extremely handy thing that we can do is to save a machine state. Here, as an example, I've opened the terminal and I've keyed in a command, but I'm not going to execute that command yet. I'm just going to leave it sit there and close the window for this virtual machine. When I do that, VirtualBox asks me if I want to save the machine state, send the shutdown signal, or power off the machine. I'm going to save the machine state. With that done, we see the status of our Linux Mint machine is listed now as saved. So when we start that machine, it will pick up exactly where we left off, with the terminal window open and with the command in place still waiting to be executed. It's also very easy to create working copies of your virtual machine. The easiest and most direct way to do this is to simply right-click the virtual machine in VirtualBox's main interface and select Clone. This will create an exact copy of the virtual machine that we're working with. You can also create machine snapshots for various testing purposes. I'll give an example of how snapshots work. Here, I have a couple of files on my virtual machine's desktop. I'm going to create a snapshot of this machine, and now I'm going to delete those files. I've also gone ahead and installed Google Chrome on this instance of this machine. But now, I'm going to boot from that saved snapshot, and as we see, the machine has rolled back to that point in time where I took that snapshot. The files I deleted have returned, and Google Chrome is no longer installed. You can create multiple snapshots from the respective guest machine's menu and later access all of a guest's snapshots from its hamburger menu on the main VirtualBox interface. And now I'm going to talk about plugging in actual real physical devices like a USB stick or a webcam into your virtual machine. By default, your external devices like USB webcams and USB drives are not recognized automatically by the guest machine when you plug them into your host machine. You have to go to the Devices dropdown and virtually plug them in. As an example, I've plugged in a USB thumb drive to my host machine. On my host machine, I've copied this picture of StrongBad to that USB drive. Now on the virtual guest machine, I go to Devices and select that USB drive from my list. It takes a few seconds, but now we see that our guest installation of Mint has mounted that USB drive. And to prove it, I see my strong bad picture on that USB stick. To remove a device from the guest machine, simply unselect it from the device's dropdown. You can also use this method to add other USB devices, and as you can see here, it's also very easy to add a webcam to the virtual machine. So I've covered pretty much all that I can think of to cover for the absolute beginner. So what are the practical uses of a virtual machine? Well, a lot in my opinion. First off, simply using a virtual machine as a learning tool is huge. And experimenting with different operating systems and not needing a physical machine to install them on is a pretty big deal. Also, the practicality of having a virtual machine installed uh, on your main machine where 
let's say that you've moved to Linux, but there are still a few um, Windows programs that you use that you just can't live without. So rather than having this set up in a dual boot situation that can really be cumbersome, having a virtual machine, as long as it's capable of running those software programs, is a lot better option, I think, and a lot easier to access than a second installation on a dual boot scenario. And another thing that I really like about virtual machines is you don't need to dedicate a physical machine to them. So in essence, they don't really cost you anything besides some of the system resources that you already have on hand. And that is providing that your system can run its main system and a virtual machine in addition to what it normally does. And a a fantastic use for virtual machines for the professional is in testing environments. It's a good place to start with software compatibility testing and patch updates and things like that. And if you watch any of those prank the scammer type channels like Kit Boga or guys like Jim Browning who straight up wreck scammers, they're using virtual machines. It's why you see them hand over the keys to their operating system to these scammers. They're most likely working off of a virtual machine clone, like a master image that they've built, or snapshots, and this stuff is hosted on secondary machines that they can afford to lose if things go south. It's a great tool for penetration testing as you're not putting any real machines at any real risk. And speaking of not putting a real machine at risk, it's a great tool for using if you do want to do some shady things, like maybe look at some risque websites. It's like they say, whatever happens in your virtual machine stays in your virtual machine. And last but not least, these virtual machines are invaluable for teaching. If I want to make a tutorial and give a one-time lesson, for example, but not clutter up my main machine, or if my primary machine is Windows but I need to do a Linux tutorial, this is perfect for that. But that's it for this one. If you want to see more videos on virtual machines, hit me up in the comments section below. I'm going to wrap this up here. Thank you so much for watching. That's it for now, and I'll see you next time. And here's some bonus content. I had a viewer get a hold of me and ask me this question. Hello, can you do a video for absolute beginners on how to install FreeOffice on Zorin OS 15 Lite? Thank you in advance. Best regards. And since I just created a Zorin OS virtual machine, this would be a great way to put that machine to use. So we're going to give it a shot and see what happens. Now, I personally do not use FreeOffice, but we're going to take a look at this and see what we can do. Now, first off, what I would recommend is would actually be to use the built-in LibreOffice that comes with Zorin OS 15. But if there is something in FreeOffice that you absolutely need to use, we're going to tackle this and see what happens. And I do see here that FreeOffice is available in a .deb package, so we should be able to just download that package and run it in Zorin. Zorin is actually Ubuntu-based, which is Debian based so you can run .deb packages just like you would an executable in Windows. So I downloaded this .deb package and had no problem opening it up. It did get to about 66% on the installation and it seemingly just hung there. Eventually I closed out the installer and decided to give it another go. And then when I gave it that second go it installed FreeOffice right away nearly instantaneously. So I think what had happened was when it hung on that 66% in the initial setup, it was basically some kind of false error. And if you absolutely need this software, go ahead and try it. I can't guarantee that it's going to work for you, but my recommended choice of software is to use the built-in open source office programs that come installed with Zorin OS. But I do hope that this helped to answer your question. Thanks for watching.